Children are our most precious gift. As the adults in their lives, we hope to guide them in learning about the world so they can grow, develop, and continue to strive toward their potential. What if the child in our life is vastly different from us in a fundamental aspect of communication? What if we want our child to be able to navigate our world, which happens to be a hearing world? How do we build the connection with our child and give them the opportunities from our hearing world? The organization featured today has figured that out locally and globally. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at Reach Us at the Intrinsic Group. Com. John Tracy Center provides parent-centered services locally and globally to young children with hearing loss, offering families hope, guidance, and encouragement. After Hollywood legend Spencer Tracy and his wife Louise Tracy's infant son was diagnosed with a profound hearing loss in 1925, Louise Treadwell Tracy devoted her time and energy to studying how deaf children could be taught to communicate with the hearing and speaking world. She patiently guided her son John into an understanding of language and lip reading. With her encouragement, he learned to speak. In 1942, Mrs. Tracy responded to a desperate call for help from 12 other mothers of young deaf children by founding John Tracy Center, which was established in 1943. JTC is now one of the world's most acclaimed private providers of audiology diagnostics, education, resources, and support for families who have infants or young children with hearing loss. Today, they serve more than 3,200 families annually. JTC's goals are to help children develop the speech, language, and listening skills they need to thrive in the hearing world. They also equip parents with the necessary knowledge and training to help their children achieve their full communication potential. They also have graduate programs in areas of education specialists as well as master's programs. And just from a personal account, I don't haven't experienced that with my own children. And yet in looking at some of the videos on the website, I have to tell you the parenting tips are so remarkable. I really wish I had known about this when my children were much younger. I am so excited to introduce my guest today, President and CEO, Kat Mathis. So let's get started. Welcome, Kat. Please share your passion about the John Tracy Center and your deep connection and commitment and what led to your involvement. Thank you, Laura. I'm I'm so pleased and honored to be talking about John Tracy. Not only kind of the passion that I have for it now, but just for the long history that it's had. And and your mention about being a parent and and understanding the needs that you have as a parent and the advice and the tips and tricks that you might need as as a parent raising young children. So you talked a little bit about what what my passion is. I, I didn't, when I first started with John Tracy, I didn't really realize this was my passion. I was attracted at a very early age to working with children and being involved with kids. My mom is an educator retired now, but I've just always had uh, an interest in working with children. And after college, I didn't know that I was going to lean into John Tracy. I actually went into software sales and worked at a, co a, a computer company. After a while in working with them in sales, it was a great job, um, paid well, and it was really exciting. But I realized that I wasn't being fulfilled at the end of the day. I remember going to my mom and saying, you know, I think I think I want to go into teaching. I think this is what I want to do. And being a longtime educator, she knew a lot and had a little bit of background um, being here in Los Angeles. She knew a lot about John Tracy. And she said, you know, you should really look into John Tracy. At the time we were John Tracy, it was John Tracy Clinic. So she said, you should go to John Tracy Clinic. I'll go with you for a tour. Let's take a look. And and so we went, we went on a tour and that was almost 20 some odd years ago in 
observing what JTC did and observing the classrooms and uh, some of the professionals at the time working with the parents, I said and felt really in my heart, this is where I need to be. This is what I need to do. And that was about 20 years ago, and I've been with JTC ever since, um, worked in many different capacities. But I think that the passion is really about giving back and the passion is really about service and giving to these families. But at the same time, I really feel fulfilled and, and these families have really taught me and these children that we work with and we serve have taught me a lot about how, how I want to live and how I want to parent and, and what kind of life I want to lead. What a beautiful story. And I just want to comment on a few things. One is your initial interest or area professional area in technology i think in some way goes hand in hand Mm -hmm. in a slightly different way right with john tc because it takes technology to a certain extent an adaptation to bring children and parents to a place of um, utilizing tools that help guide within a hearing and speaking world. And I I love that history of your personal history and then where you got to. And the other thing that you said that I think is just charming and wonderful and so touches my heart, you learn from the teachers, the parents, and the students that impact and fill your soul and your life and also make you a, a better person, a better parent, a better, you know, professional. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, even a deeper history, my my grandmother and my mom's mom, who would have probably been about 100 this year, she knew some parents that went through and were some of the very first preschoolers that had very first preschoolers at John Tracy. I have a cousin who um, has a unilateral loss, meaning on one side, who received letters in the mail. At that time, that's what technology was about, um, and kind of reached out for tips and tricks. Now that it's on the website and you can see them on video or you can email, but Technology advances in so many ways, not only for children with hearing loss, but also the way that families can access information has just been phenomenal over the years. And I think access and advances in technologies just unbelievably helped families navigate what they can do and how they can help their children and how they can connect with others. It's so it's so true. And as we were kind of chatting just before we started this interview and when I sort of said in my opening is I truly wish I had known about this when my kids were little because the videos really are for any parent or any caregiver or any grandparent who is interfacing with young children. I, I can give you scenario after scenario, but even the idea of patiently waiting for a response the way to sort of guide, but really wait for the feedback and look for the feedback and find alternative ways is just as much for the hearing community as well as the hearing loss community. But Mm -hmm. applying that in this specific way was eye-opening for me personally. And I really, I, I appreciate that. I encourage every listener, regardless of hearing loss or not, to visit your website and look at those videos. They are short, sweet, to the point, and absolutely terrific I thought thank you yeah I mean it's about communication and it's about really respecting that family's choice for their child and then how do we give them those tools to build on their child's communication whatever language they're speaking how do they provide that purposeful pausing to draw that child in and really make those connections because as a parent that's really what you want for your child you want them to have connections and communication and skills that will help them thrive a hundred percent and um and i think that the idea of building a bridge with your child the best way we do it is through communication. We often assume through language and hearing, and when that isn't a given, you have to find other ways. And having a child on the autism spectrum, I understood that early on as he was Mm. nonverbal for a period of time, and I'll just share this, and used to bite his hand. And I remember at the dinner table, I would stop everything, and we would hang out as a family and try to figure out what he was trying to tell us because he was so frustrated 
because he wanted to communicate and be part of it. And so it was sort of natural for me to stop and do that. But had I known you were available, honestly, those tips were just incredible. So again, that's my vote of encouragement for everyone to check it out regardless. So I want to hear about the programs that you offer. I know you have graduate school and we can go there, but I want to hear for the for the little kids, when someone recognizes that their child may have a hearing loss, what are some of the steps that they can take? What do you offer? Sure. And, and I'll actually back up even before a parent even thinking that their child might have a hearing loss, because one of the programs, and, and like you said, we have a variety of programs, but one of the things that we provide is... Um, diagnostic audiology testing and for newborns all the way up to 18 years of age. So now, you know, there's a law in place when a baby is born that the hospital will provide a hearing screening. Sometimes those screenings, there's a red flag and that need to be followed up on. And those children, those newborns and families will be referred to us, to John Tracy Center, so that we can actually follow up and determine what that red flag was, what that screening showed, and whether or not there is a hearing loss. We could also do that for other children as they're um, developing and a pediatrician or a parent or a school might notice, you know, they don't really seem to meet those language milestones or speech milestones and hearing loss might be the case. Let's check that out. Typically, you know, for children um, that have some other disorders or other syndromes, children with autism, some of those language milestones don't follow the same way. And so we need to determine whether or not it's a hearing loss or something else is going on. If a hearing loss is diagnosed, then we have the ability to have that family come to us for a variety of different programs. Obviously, depending on the age of the child, we have a counselor available for families to help them right away. And we have different teachers that have different experience. We also um, are expanding on our speech and language services where we not only will see children just with hearing loss, but we're available and we're opening kind of more doors with insurance uh, to be able to provide speech and language therapy for children that may have a speech disorder. We are unique in the sense that we're a family center, so we want to make sure that the parents understand how to help their child. We're not just going to bring a child in and the parent wait in the waiting room, you know, we'll bring them in. So depending on the age of the child and the stage of where they are, we have a parent-infant program, meaning for newborns to three years of age. Families can meet one-on-one with a teacher, and really it's in a home-like setting. Now during COVID, a lot of that's happening uh, through telepractice, but the rooms that we have in our center actually look like a home. They have a little kitchen, a kitchen table, um, there's a couch, and um, we do a lot of cooking and a lot of home-based routines that a family would do with their child, and then we work on This is how you can input language. This is how you can use communication skills throughout the day during your home routines. What is your home like? And how can we bring that in? Another big part of parent-infant in learning when, when your child has a hearing loss, parents need to be able to share and learn from other parents. Yes. Other parents that are also going through the same thing because most parents don't have other friends with children with hearing loss that they know because it's considered a low incident. Typically, about 93% of children born with hearing loss are born to hearing parents. Wow, I didn't realize that. We set up what we call our Friday Family School, and really it's a center-based program where parents can come together and be with each other and talk about the issues, the challenges and the joys that they have of being a parent of a child with hearing loss. And there's different components of that. Together, they will work together, check in and learn from the teacher, do different um, activities that they can then carry on to their home. And then the parents will actually leave their children um, with the teachers and therapists, and they will go down the hall to a classroom where they will have an adult class about language 
milestones about different phases of auditory learning or how can um, I build my child's literacy skills? What does it look like when I can prepare my child eventually for preschool or how can I help in what in the United States we call the IFSP, the Family Service Plan, or as they're transitioning into after three, the IEP, the Individual Education Plan. So we're giving parents these resources and tools, and they're all at different levels. So the new families are coming in learning from the veteran families, and also the veteran families are giving back because they remember what it's like. Uh, we also will bring our alumni back and they'll hear from them and see that there's kind of this light at the end of the tunnel that they're in. What a great way to model what is and what can be, as well as I'm guessing that some of the parents and some of the children end up being lifelong friends. Absolutely lifelong friends and the families will travel together or they'll um, hang out together and you know even though they're all you know throughout southern california and we'll get to the international and global component in a minute but absolutely and no one wants to feel alone so by creating this center you have a hub and i love the idea that you mentioned earlier about recreating a kitchen or a living space or something that could be uh, you know, emulated at home so that a child at that age starts to recognize and connect. And so it's not a stretch and it becomes a repetitious pattern that then becomes integrated. So it's, and it also feels cozy and comfortable and safe when you do that. Absolutely. Cozy, comfortable, safe. Those are all the things that, you know, we want this space to be. We also want the parent to feel empowered that they are the ones really being that child's first teacher. Because children learn by those that they're most comfortable with, by the people that they love. And our goal and a value that we really respect is that we empower families and their children. So we don't want it to be a very sterile place where there's a table and I, as the teacher, am going to teach your child to learn to listen and talk and communicate. It's really the parent. And I would extend that concept of education as an absolute value that you uphold the way you talk about it i wish this could be spread for any educational environment because the concept of creating the opportunity for the caregiver parent whoever's in that primary role to take it on as their own through modeling and through practice versus, you know, being shamed, you're not doing the right way, or I'll teach you, or I will fix your kid, or I will, whatever, yes. is such a refreshing, beautiful frame. I think collaboration is one of the things that we really value and we understand that, especially working with families with children with special needs. In the beginning, they're really scared or they can be really scared. They can't imagine what it will be like a year, two, three. And the only thing parents generally want, as a parent myself, I think I can say, is our kids to be happy, healthy, and productive. And we want them to understand as compassionate and committed professionals, we're here to collaborate with you. Um, we're coming alongside this path with you. Our whole staff, the culture is just so vital to what we do and and the values that we hold and the vision that we have for these families. It's, it's um, a really a tribute to Mrs. Tracy. I think uh, I would have loved to known her. I would have loved to see her kind of walk into the classroom and, and see how she upheld herself. But it was really this, what I hear from and what I read is that, that she really held that kind of, that empathy and, and working with families and collaboration it was really phenomenal. We want to make sure that that spirit still lives wherever we go. So you mentioned earlier your global reach. So I'd yeah. love to hear a bit about that. The other component of the listening and spoken language therapy, or what it may also be known as auditory verbal therapy, um, we provide that as well as speech language therapy for um, children locally to come into our site. We also provide it through telepractice and um, we're also providing that anywhere in the world, really. Um, and technology is amazing that you're able to do that and stay connected. And so 
uh, what listening and spoken language therapy is, is um, it's more of an individualized session and it's working on for, for newborns in, until their children are a little bit older, but guiding the parents, help their parents, help parents really learn how to help their child develop the language that they speak at home. Comprehensive services kind of helping that active listening through books, through daily routine, um, through singing, through vocal play, what things are they working on at school? How can we help build that listening and spoken language? How can we help that child once they're going into school in a non-COVID world? How can we help that child that's in school, in a mainstream class and classroom, advocate for themselves and, and be able to utilize the technology that they have to be able to communicate and work within a classroom. Are you doing that all virtually now because of COVID? Now what we have going on on site is our audiology services because that's essential medical services that we're providing. We have changed it a little bit to make sure we, you know, fit within COVID and spreading out our appointments, which is harder because we're not able to see as many families and children. Um, and then we have our preschool. We have a on-site preschool that has children with hearing loss as well as typical hearing children interacting and playing together. We, we had that last March all the way until the fall, that switch during COVID, we did that virtually. Imagine preschool virtually, wow. that's a little hard. But our yeah. teachers are phenomenal, they're amazing. And then um, in the fall, they started doing a hybrid and bringing some of the families back that felt comfortable. Now almost all the kids are back on preschool on site, yeah. which is great. The, the children really need that interaction and, and connection and social skill building. We do have our uh, listening and spoken language, our speech and language, individual therapy, the majority of that is happening um, through telepractice online. Because we have had this background and experience working with families all over the world, Mrs. Tracy used to write letters to families all over the world that would write into her, I, you know, I hear, you know, that you have experience. Can you tell me how to do this? So over the years, what used to be called our correspondence course, corresponding through letters, that has changed and developed and, and we have kind of built that up to be an online platform for families to be able to access information if they have um, internet. But if they don't, we can still write letters. We, ha we still have families where we still write and still send physical mail out to families that are uh, learning the different skills, specifically for those early years, that early intervention from newborns to about five or six years old. Our online platform's really geared for families to, to learn those tips and tricks and ideas and advice and communicate with us and how to build their child's skills. Because we had that already kind of set up, and because our staff is really phenomenal and very hardworking, we were able to, when COVID hit, we were able to transition all of the families that we serve in our educational services uh, the week that we closed our doors. Wow. Everything online. You know, we're still very uncertain about the impact that COVID is going to have on our children, For and sure. we really did not want this to have an additional impact on the families that we serve. We have an, a, a platform for parents to enroll to our distance ed parent education where they can see additional videos, um, additional chapters and courses that they can take at their own pace. And um, so that's our worldwide parent education. And over the years we have, during our summer, we've been able to bring families on site for a two week period. Um, it's an amazing time of year. We didn't, we were unable to do it this last summer and we're not doing it this summer because of obviously COVID restrictions and travel. Um, but families from all over the world will sign up with their preschoolers and toddlers and come for two weeks and they will learn from each other. They will learn from us. Their children will go to the toddler or preschool class. It's, it's a really magical time because the, the majority of the families spend all year waiting to come. Some families will, you know, be in contact with us as soon as their baby's like just a few months old and, and wait 
you know, until they, they get to the point where they're able to come. And so it's really magical that parents come together from all over the world. And those families, like you said, those families will also become lifelong friends. Almost the last 20 or maybe so years, we've been able to offer a um, English session and a Spanish session. So everything is in um, Spanish for Spanish speaking families. Um, they come from all over the world and Spanish speaking countries and come and learn from each other and, and be able to, to build their skills. For families who can't come but can still access online, they end up being part of that community just in a distance way, but they get access to resources. I assume they can connect with other families or ask questions, and there's an engagement component that ha is inc sounds incredibly valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, there's been, um, COVID's been very challenging and difficult, but there's also been a lot of eye-opening moments and moments of clarity for us that we can still provide certain services and, and connections virtually because technology is pretty amazing. So families don't have to spend money on um, a ticket to come to Los Angeles. They're able to log in wherever they are and, and that's, that's really helpful. And I think that that's gonna continue to be something that we offer, even when we are able to bring families on site, which for us is really uplifting and great, but it's not always feasible for most families. Um, so we'll be able to now have that offering. You read my mind, because I think with COVID as horrible and horrible as it has been, I mean, beyond words and with the deaths and the anxiety and the isolation and the child development piece you mentioned, sometimes there are moments of silver linings. We do serve all socioeconomic backgrounds, you know, and um, there is an emphasis on, on low-income families. Um, and, and we recognize in other countries, the services are very different than they are. Even in Southern California versus different parts of California, they can be very different too. It's true, and you're really setting the standard. It's great that you target low-income families as well because you're also giving them resources that they wouldn't otherwise have. And uh, I wanted to go back to something you said before. I, I can't imagine that Mrs. Tracy in some kind of karma way didn't know in setting this up when something you know very sad in her own life occurred she rose to the occasion and now has created through her own network this amazing center that her legacy is just um is absolutely sounds like it's in the culture the walls and now extended globally yeah she was really a thought leader she was really innovative especially you know if you think about it in the 40s you know, John had already kind of grown up and yeah. she was um, an actress and married to Spencer Tracy. She didn't really need to do this. Right. Um, she had this calling and she had this spirit and, and she was really a thought leader in a lot of different ways. She knew that it was possible for her child to have and reach his full potential. And she really wanted to pass that on to other families and other parents. And she was so innovative. Um, there's a video that I've watched of her talking about, we need to get these babies identified, you know, at, at three months of age, really early. And, and that, that didn't happen until 20 years after she actually made that comment. It was just so, phenomenal she knew the early intervention is the key and she also knew that families were the key it's just you know we want to continue on that kind of innovation and thought leadership so share with me a bit about the educational opportunities for folks who are interested in getting a graduate degree or a specialist degree you know in the united states there is just a giant need for teachers I think that there's even a, a larger need for teachers that are specialized, working with um, children with any kind of special education degree. Teachers aren't seen as glamorous as, as many other professions, unfortunately. Um, but I do think maybe during COVID, a lot of people are recognizing how valuable teachers are and how amazing and hardworking and, and how needed they are. We have a program, a master's degree in teaching credential program in partnership with Mount St. Mary's University, which is just down the street from us here in Los Angeles. 
And the program is phenomenal. It, it does um, focus around and is rooted in John Tracy's kind of core values in um, being family centered. And I think those are a lot of the values that uh, Mount St. Mary's University also um, views as very core and, and critical to training their, their students and their scholars. So it's a graduate program and the graduate program, and we have all of our information on our website that students can um, enroll. And really it's about a, a year and a half program. At the end of it, almost guaranteed that they will have a position and a job at the end That's of it. Great. Because schools are coming to us halfway through the year saying, we need a graduate student. We need, you know, we need your teacher. As soon as they're done, we'd love to um, have them, you know, teach this classroom. We're in need. And they really learn alongside our teachers. They learn about being family centered. They learn about working with children. So they get a lot of hands on and a ton of mentoring. I went through the graduate program and the mentoring and being able to be here and see families and see teachers is just so valuable. And, and they're able, because we have an audiology clinic as well and diagnostics, they're able to see firsthand that technology and, and how to, to work with different hearing aids or cochlear implants and all the different hearing accessories that are needed in the classroom. They get that, that hands-on experience and really learn right away that is, um, will help them down the road, wh whatever kind of classroom they go into. Being a social worker, having graduated many, many, many years ago, and then doing my doctor work much later, the idea of theory and application combined, and in this case, the adaptation of technology is so incredibly useful. I think every master's program, no matter what area, should have that kind of internship application. What do you see in the future? What do you see is next for JTC as you continue to lead? Such a great question. Um, there's so many different things that we wanna make sure that we continue to be impactful and innovative and, and inclusive in terms of what children and families are telling us that they need. I think technology is a phenomenal thing, but we're always gonna have lower income families or families that may not have access to that technology. Because we work with families globally, we do know that there are certain countries and families that may not have the access or the opportunities that, that we might have here in the United States or in Los Angeles. I think that what is in store for us is that we continue to explore and be innovative with how we can continue to provide services. It is very difficult for someone with hearing loss, and it can be very difficult with someone for he with hearing loss to access in information or listen to someone or a teacher through Zoom. You know, yeah. there's a degraded signal. There is, there could be a lag time. The closed captioning could be different. And so the opportunity to make sure that we push for um, inclusive and accessibility for these children and teenagers and, and kids and families, um, that's something that we are making sure that we continue to do. And we work very closely with other schools within California, with the state of California, to make sure that all those policies and everything is in place so that kids can have that access and um, that there's no gap. Our biggest focus, you know, is on listening and spoken language and being a family centered. We also recognize that there are other choices that families make for their family and for their child. And, and we respect that. And we're here for those families to make sure that they have that information and knowledge and resources. Right, it's about an informed choice. You're, and I love that because it's embedded in your culture and in your values. Right, absolutely. Small and Gutsy is sponsored by The Intrinsic Group, my boutique management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes, and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. We'd love to invite you to be a sponsor. So if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com.
Toward the end of our interview, we ask a quick round of what we call quick gutsy questions. So if you don't mind, I'm going to start doing those and they're fun and meant to be, you know, just respond what's you know, off the top of your head. If you the answer cannot be money or funding, what is at the top of your wish list for JTC? It's hard as a nonprofit to not say money or funding right from the very beginning because we know that that can go to so many different ways. Um, I think that, you know, we just talked a little bit about outreach and knowledge and understanding. I think my um, wish is that families have an understanding that pediatricians, that professionals, that hospitals, uh, that teachers have an understanding of who we are and what we may be able to help provide for a family that might have a question. I think that outreach, that ability to know that we're here as one of the resources within Southern California, but also worldwide that we're here, that we're here and, and we're not going anywhere. If you were to think of a song that describes the John Tracy Center, what would it be? We had a staff um, retreat not so long ago. That was one of the questions on our survey. And the okay. staff the staff came back and um, gave feedback about what, what that would be. Okay, I think her name is Andrea Day, and it's the song is like, Rise Up. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one of the songs that, that someone had mentioned that I felt was, you know, really um, described JTC, it described the resiliency of the families, the families yes. that we work with, that no matter what, families really do rise to the occasion. And it's all because they're embedded in this love for their child. They will do phenomenal things and make some really serious sacrifices. Mm -hmm. That song is, is, she sings it so beautifully and it's just yeah. about, you know, rising up even when things are getting down that you're going to continue to to make that happen and so i think that resiliency really um sheds light to the families that we work with and and children and families we serve what is something that outsiders or maybe even a few insiders don't know about john tracy center I mean, I think that we've changed over the years in terms of just like how education for a child with hearing loss or a, a, a deaf or hard of hearing child has changed over the years. Technology has changed over the years. I think the misconception is that we are very stringent and we think one way. I, I, this is just a thought, but maybe that, you know, this is the way and the only way. And, and really the misconception is. We respect the family's choice for their child. We are experts in this in, in, in one component, but we recognize that the family has a choice and we're here for them, providing that support and guidance and that education. Um, the other misconception um, may be, and I mentioned earlier, we had used to be John Tracy Clinic, and that has a very medical component. Now, we do provide diagnostic audiology, which is a medical component, um, those hearing tests, but the center really, that word is really more of what we do. We're family centered. We work with the family. It is not a sterile environment where we're working on listening and language. We're involving the whole family. And so I think that component and was one of the reasons why we switched to John Tracy Center. We're still JTC. Everyone calls us JTC. Um, that center component is really kind of we want that to be what people think about when they say JTC. You know, it, it is a center. We are involving the whole family. What makes your organization particularly gutsy? I mean, I think the, the gutsiness is that not all education is thought of the way that we think about education. I think that we're gutsy in taking a step of making sure that the parents are included, making sure that the, that the family is really the one that we're focusing on and not just the child. I think that's a really gutsy component of what we do. It could be a business where we, you know, do a lot of the higher end and, and charge a lot of money um, for the therapy and the services that we provide, but that's, that's not as our nonprofit and our kind of core 
goal is to work with all families and to make sure that children who are deaf or hard of hearing have opportunities to develop speech language and listening skills that they need to thrive. Um, so those those are kind of the, the gutsy things I think we do. <laughs> and one last gutsy question is if you could get, you already have a huge celebrity sort of as the founding, but if you could get one current celebrity or influencer to endorse or talk about JTC, who might that be? Well, it's funny because we are rooted in, in kind of Hollywood, but most people don't know who Spencer Tracy is anymore. <laughs> most people don't know that Hollywood connection. So we don't, we've kind of lost it. A lot of that old Hollywood is yeah. gone. So I would love, you know, we're in the hub. We're, we're, we're in Los Angeles. There's just so many um, amazing celebrities out there that are doing amazing things. And I think I respect that so much. I think, um, oh God, I wouldn't be able to pick just one. I, you know, being in Los Angeles, I love athletes. I'm an athlete myself. I think the Lakers are amazing. That's an amazing. Um, let's get the whole team. Let's get the whole team in here, right? Um, I, I think that there are some phenomenal uh, women out there that are amazing advocates for many different charities. I would love to see any of those women, especially women that are um, parents. I wish I was better at naming celebrities so I could name them all off and we could connect to them. <laughs> and one of the things that I think you just made me think of is wouldn't it be great if any of those celebrities or teams would just come and take a tour? It would be so phenomenal to have like a mother's brunch or a celebrity. I don't know why I keep focusing on, oh, on like mothers, that. but women, you know, um, in Los Angeles to be able to come and take a look at what we do because just like when I came with my mom so many years ago, it pulled something in me and I wasn't even a parent at the time. Share with me how people can reach you and how they can access sure. JTC. Our website has all of our information, www.jtc.org. Anyone at any time can email me, cmathis at jtc.org or just view our website and there's a contact us button there and they can they can access and ask any questions. I want to thank you for being here, Kat. You just you shared so much of your own personal journey as well as the programmatic aspects, the global aspects, the educational aspects, your values, the culture of the organization. I I learned so much from you and um and I just appreciate the time that you gave Small and Gutsy today. Well, thank you, Laura. It's it's so easy for me to talk about JTC because I just, it's in my heart and I've been here for so long. I just love it so much. Um, and I just appreciate that you have this platform that we're able to get that out and get the word out, um, not only about JTC, but other amazing organizations that are available um, for those. And, you know, I think JTC is pretty phenomenal. I'm a little biased, but... <laughs> <laughs> You're allowed to be. You're supposed to be. You should be. That's your job, and it's in your heart, and it's your passion. And that's really what I wanted to capture. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Give us some stars and write a review on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts. Or buy us a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy. These podcasts fill the soul. Learning about these amazing organizations reminds me of the good in this world. Thanks, Sally G. We really appreciate it, and we'll keep them coming. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, my co-producer, sound engineer, and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. Gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, investors, and donors to this small but mighty network. Of course, we can take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff, and thanks for listening.